Good afternoon. So this is our uh, 750 economic growth. And today we're going to look at uh, this paper by Pietro Pareto. Uh, this is published in 2018 in European Economic Review. And it is one of the uh, most powerful papers on, uh, on second generation Schumpeterian models. So what you see here is the introduction uh, paragraph of the paper, setting its birth at the publication of Romer 1986, modern endogenous growth economics is now in its thirties and has thus reached full maturity. By all measures of scholarly accomplishment, it is a success. The field is vibrant and expanding and prickle and pulse relevant. The Schumpeterian branch of the theory in particular has generated many insights that have been successfully applied to a wide range of topics. So uh, remember there was this debate of scale effects, right? So in the first generation models, uh, there was this scale effect originating from the size of the economy, right? On the growth rate, the size of the economy, especially the number of researchers employed in, in R&D sector, uh, would be increasing the growth rate, right? In theory, but in the data, we don't see we don't see such an increase, right? We don't see we see we see a huge increase in the population of, uh, you know, the the population of countries, the workforce employed in R and D, and so on and so forth. But we do not see uh, uh, the increase in the long run growth rate of the economy. So that was first identified by Charles Jones in 1995. And that created the scale effects critique. And after that, some growth theorists, including Jones uh, himself, uh, but also Samuel Kortum and some other guys, uh, they, they wrote down models where the scale effect is sterilized by imposing decreasing returns to knowledge. All right? So if we, if we impose decreasing returns to knowledge, uh, the population size no longer affects the growth rate, but instead population growth rate might, in, uh, might, might affect uh, the, 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 the long run growth rate of the economy. And uh, this is called semi endogenous growth because it is generally believed that population growth rate in the long run cannot be quite easily altered by, uh, by policies, right? I mean, instead of, uh, you know, R&D subsidies or, uh, or certain political measures that increase the uh, intensity of entrepreneurship in the economy, population growth is largely determined by social factors or demographic factors. So it is largely independent. So that was a negative result in terms of the policy relevance of, uh, of, the, of the growth theory, right? Uh, so the growth was still endogenous, but it's only semi-endogenous in the long run because it depends centrally on the population growth rate. Uh, so that was a so that that type of negative result was not, of course, very well you know very well received by the Schumpeterian guys. So then came the age of second generation Schumpeterian models, right? Remember that at 1998, as a response to this scale effect critique, some uh, some uh, you know Schumpeterian theorists wrote down newer models where there is uh, you know the, the technological landscape of the economy is characterized. Uh, by two dimensions of innovation. On the, on the horizontal dimension, we have product innovations, right? So new products, new consumer products or new investment products are introduced uh, in the form of, for instance, intermediate inputs, right? And in the vertical dimension, there is this vertical innovation dimension where uh, the existing products are uh, improved, are constantly improved to have higher qualities or higher productivities, all right? So that was, so there are uh, a couple of papers uh, by, uh, by Young, by Pareto, by, by Hovitt uh, in, the, in the late 90s. So those papers convincingly argued that, okay, uh, the second generation Schumpeterian models uh, are correcting the scale, are, are sterilizing the scale effects, but still, the growth rate in the long run is, uh, you know, is uh, policy relevant, 
okay? So research subsidies and other, other economic policy measures or, or, or research policy measures or science policy measures affect the technological dynamism of the economy, all right? So that was there. And later on, the second generation Schumpeterian models uh, were applied in, in many different areas. So there, were, there was an empirical uh, literature. Uh, for instance, you can check the papers written by Jacob Madsen. Uh, and there was also the expansion of the literature, uh, you know, in, in more micro theoretical dimensions, such as the principal agent problems, is, you know, involving in the uh, determination of uh, you know research subsidies. Uh, what is the optimal uh, way of managing public research or the or the basic research and applied research and so on and so forth. So there was there was this wide wide literature. Uh, most recently, literature is also expanding on heterogeneous uh, heter you know heterogeneous firm. Uh, or nitrogen sectors, right? So in the economy, uh, leaders and followers, uh, so there, there are firms that are, that are leaders in certain uh, sectors and there are firms that are followers. So innovation by these leaders and followers also differ. Innovation by entrants and incumbents by also, uh, is also uh, an important distinction. So. Right now, for instance, if you check the papers written by, for instance, uh, Ufuk Akcid from the University of Chicago, you will see that uh, those second generation Schumpeterian models with, with firm heterogeneity uh, are also applied uh, to the data, especially the US, US data at the firm level and generate many insights for the, for the, uh, for the growth economists and, and, and policy relevance is still there. Now, Pareto, is um, is rather uh, persistent in in uh, promoting the second generation Schumpeterian agenda, okay? And this paper shows. So this paper is written uh, as a you know as an overarching critique of the semi endogenous growth results of uh, Charles Jones, uh, precisely, uh, and here. When he says robust, he basically argues that the linearity or the scale effect critique is not really uh, a binding issue for the for the Schumpeterian growth theory, and you will see you will see how. Okay, so let's let's look at this linearity critique. All right, so suppose that this is output, right? Why why is output and there is a bunch of constants here because this is the solution of the model actually. And N here is the mass of intermediate inputs. Okay, so this is the this is the horizontal dimension of innovation. So there are there are a number of number of products in the economy, and that that number is equal to N. So these could be consumer products or, or intermediate inputs. And Z here is the average quality of these intermediate goods. All right. So if so here it is. Uh, described in terms of intermediate inputs. So we have N intermediate inputs and Z is the average quality of these intermediate inputs, right? And the production function in, in, the, in the aggregate form uh, also features labor force here, okay, L. Now, sigma and kappa are positive parameters, all right? And constant endogenous growth does not require exact linearity of the production structure in the growth driving factor. So here is the growth driving factor is Z, the average quality, right? Because the, the, because the number of firms with respect to population will be a constant in, in most of these models in the very long run. So what drives, what drives population, uh, what, sorry, what drives output per worker is basically this average quality. And as you see, kappa does not have to be equal to one. Okay, uh, Pareto in this paper shows that there is actually a K max, a maximum level for kappa, okay? And the kappa parameter can take any value between one and K max, okay? So the, so the critique by Jones that implies 
you know, Schumpeterian models require kappa to be exactly equal to one is not, is not really an important critique because models can actually be written down uh, with this parameter kappa taking any value between one and some number k max or kappa max uh, that is larger than one, okay? So in that particular respect, it is called robust. Okay, so, so what does the model look like? Well, there are households, they work, they consume and they save, right? So you know this from, uh, from many general equity models, so this is there. So there is a sector that produces the final good, okay? These are, these are final good producers, they are competitive, right? And there are intermediate good producers. So they produce the intermediate inputs and they also invest in R&D, right? So, so these, the, these are the firms that are on the, um, 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 that, are, that are innovating on the vertical dimension, right? So they already are producing these intermediate goods. They're already realizing some local monopoly profits and they also invest in R&D by taking uh, uh, R&D investment decisions, right? And there are also entrepreneurs. Now, entrepreneurs uh, innovate on the horizontal dimension by creating new intermediate goods, right? So, so the, the, the number of intermediate goods in time uh, expands as a result of such product innovation activity, right? So that's, that's the overall picture of the model. Now, let's look at the households first. Uh, that's, uh, by the way, of course, the model here is expressed in uh, continuous time. And this is, the, this is the model, the household side. So there is this intertemporal utility. That intertemporal utility depends on the pure discount rate, but be correct for the population growth rate because the household, you know, the, if, if you imagine that households are located in the unit interval, we can, uh, we can assume that the size of each household is equal to L, right? LT is the population then. So this population grows in time, as you see, and lambda would be the population growth rate. So we, of course, correct for the increase in the size of population when we write the effective discount rate. Uh, utility function is with respect to consumption per, per worker, all right? So C is the average consumption, L is the population. So C over L is consumption per capita, for instance. Eta is the, uh, is the uh, preference parameter, uh, which is greater than zero. So this is the asset accumulation equation. So there is, a, there is an asset, a, a financial asset, you may imagine. Uh, there's, there's a return, and then there's wage income, right? And there is consumption. This is the total consumption of the household. And the remaining part becomes the same, right? So the initial stock is given, so this is the pretty, pretty simple, uh, you know, Ramsey problem. Uh, using this problem, we obtain the earlier equation, as you know, and uh, we obtain this result. So you already, you are, you are already familiar with this, with this description of the earlier equation. So G here is the uh, growth rate of uh, uh, G here is this growth rate. Okay, so it is uh, uh, it is the growth rate of consumption per capita, and here epsilon is eta, right? So in the in the earlier model we had epsilon as the uh, as the preference parameter, so here we have eta, so they are they are the same. And if utility would be logarithmic, right? If this utility function was log C of L, log of C divided by L, we would have uh, this earlier equation, as you know, right? And in the discrete time case, uh, we also have this, right? So you are also familiar with the discrete time, uh, discrete time uh, setup. But here we're gonna continue with the continuous time model. Now, the final good producers. So this is the final good production function, all right? So it's, 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 it looks a bit complex than what you, what you have already seen, but uh, essentially it is the same argument, right? What is the argument? Well, 
these are the uh, number of machines that you use, okay? Uh, there is labor here, obviously, and this is the quality. Now, quality has two dimensions. One is product level. Yeah, I mean, it is, it is product specific, ZIT, and the other is the externality associated with the average, all right? Now, that average, as you see, is the average of the existing uh, average quality of the existing intermediate inputs. And why is that important? Because we're, there are knowledge spillovers between different sectors. So if, if one task of production is becoming more quality, so possibly uh, the other, other, other sectors, other, other intermediate inputs also learn from that. Uh, so productivity also, so productivity of intermediate good I also benefits from the average quality. So there is this normalization factor here. So kappa, of course, is important. And we also we also sterilize the love of variety effect, right? So because this is an integral, uh, this tells you if you, if you if you do not have this term, if sigma is equal to zero, if uh, if this parameter sigma is equal to zero, there is no term here. So then this means uh, whenever whenever product uh, product the number of products increase that always increases the output so we want to sterilize this effect because this is uh, this is for uh, aggregate aggregation I mean this is because of aggregation only so we we sterilize this effect by putting a sigma parameter here so sigma is positive uh, and the number of so the mere mere number of products is not important okay so this this law of variety effect sigma must be there for more realistic results. Uh, now for profit maximization, remember that final good producers are competitive, so they must they want to maximize profits. So if you write the profit function here, you have pi xi, right? This is the uh, this is the cost paid for the machines, and then there is uh, labor labor cost so uh this is the first of the condition for for machine i right so you also you also know this result uh we already studied so this is uh exactly as in the uh product variety model then intermediate producers are working with the uh are working as local monopolies right now in the earlier definitions, we had this, right? Only, only this part. So uh, this is the sales, total sales, minus the production cost. Here, here, uh, we also introduce uh, fixed operating costs, okay? Why is that there? Because, uh, so there's, there's another paper by Pareto published in 2007. It's called Manhattan Metaphor. Uh, it's actually uh, with one co-author. Uh, in that paper, they explain what are the essential differences between horizontal innovation and vertical innovation. And that essential difference boils down to, to such fixed operating costs. When, when we introduce fixed operating costs, models become uh, internally more, more, more consistent uh, and uh, you know the, the the movement of product variety per per worker uh, makes a lot of sense because so the idea is that uh, there must be a limit on the profitability of the firms, right? A down uh, a, a lower bound limit and the upper bound limit because imagine that the product space is like the Manhattan Island. In the Manhattan Island, uh, you can always increase the height of the buildings by by creating uh, skyscrapers with more floors uh, but you cannot increase the number of um, products uh, to infinity right because the the product space is limited uh, for monopolistic competition to be profitable in the long run you must have such fixed costs uh, R&D technology is extremely simple, as you see. Knowledge production at the firm level 
this is the increase in the quality of intermediate with I, depends on the money the firm spent on investment. Okay? So each firm, each firm, uh, each uh, incumbent firm, increase the quality of the product by spending a certain amount to R&D. Okay? So then the dynamic program of the, of the firm is written in this way. So this is the value of the firm, right? At time zero. This is the time variant, uh, time variant discount factor, right? So, so this is the profit minus R&D investment, right? So profit originating from the uh, production of the uh, machine or the product variety, and then there's money spent on R&D investment, okay? So, so if you look at it, there is one household problem, which is a, which is a continuous time dynamic program, right? An optimal control, optimal, optimal control theory problem. So this gives you the earlier equation. Then there is this final good producer firm that basically uh, solves a static uh, profit maximization problem. Then we have the uh, incumbent firm that produces machine I and that invests in R&D. And then there is this another uh, optimal control problem. Uh, the Hamiltonian is here, right? So this is the Hamiltonian function. There's profit minus investment in R&D times the uh, cost state factor and the cost state uh, equation, right? So here you have the constraint, uh, IIT. So that's pretty standard. And if you write down this explicitly, you have this, right? Now realize that this is very similar to the uh, investment problem that we studied in uh, ECO 719, right? So uh, the control variables here are price and the investment, right? So the firm takes two decisions. First, the firm tries to find the profit maximizing price, okay, for, for the state. So this, this is a static uh, part of the problem, right? Because the price does not affect uh, the uh, research quality. And there is another control variable now that control variable is, is, a, is of dynamic nature. Why? Because it increases the product quality ZI, okay? So uh, again, pricing and R&D decisions are independent. So that's, that's important. So, but you can, you, you, you know how to characterize the solution of such a problem, right? You take the first of the conditions and you find the, uh, the equations that characterize the optimal path. Now, using these results, uh, you first find the return to R&D, all right? The return to R&D must satisfy this equation. This is the research arbitrage. What does it tell you? It tells you that, well, the uh, value associated, the, 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 uh, so the, the cost you want to, Pay for R and D because you want to you want to find the funds right from the capital market to finance your R and D spending. Now that cost must depend on the uh, return of R and D, right? Uh, and that return depend have two side two parts. One part is the direct effect of this product quality on profit. Okay, and the other part is the increase in the value of it. Remember, this is this is like another earlier equation. Uh, remember, seven one nine classes. I I uh, explained with with great care how you can interpret the uh, cost state equation. So, from the cost state equation of this problem, you find this research arbitrage equation. Again, that tells you that the firm. Uh, 
is willing to accept the cost of R&D, which is the interest rate in the economy, because the firm is going to apply for a loan for the R&D spending. And that cost must be equal to the expected return. Here, the expected return is the increase in the value of the knowledge stock and the direct effect of this knowledge variable on the profitability of the firm. Okay. Now, R&D decision implies Q is always equal to one. Why? Because you have linearity here. So if I is positive, if this firm will invest in R&D, then Q must be equal to one. So Q is always constant. So this term will drop. All right. And then the prices, the price will always equal to one over theta. There is, uh, there's like a limit pricing here. So then, uh, if you put all these all these results together, you arrive at this result, right? So what does it tell you here? PT is the price index. Okay, so um, the definition of PT is not. Um, so here, as you see, PT becomes the price next because it is fixed for all, it is fixed for all intermediate inputs. So there is a symmetric equilibrium. In this symmetric equilibrium, X is the number of machines to be produced. Z is the average quality uh, and, P, and P is the price, okay? Now we want to understand how entrepreneurs behave. All right. Now, for this reason, we assume uh, a particular horizontal innovation technology. Okay, so n dot is the increase in the number of uh, products. Okay, so that depends on uh, this entrepreneurship function. All right. So E T is the money spent on uh, entrepreneurship activities. And beta ZT is the is the is the cost, okay. And the value of a firm now uh, must be consistent with that. Uh, so I think there is a typo here. So this will be beta ZT, okay. So so what happens if this value? So remember that this is the value of the firm, right? So if value is equal to at least the cost, right? Since entrepreneurs are also competitive, then they enter. They, they create, they, they bear the costs of entry, all right? And this requires, of course, another arbitrage equation, right? Again, these entrepreneurs will find funds, right? These funds will be obtained in the financial market by the by, you know, by uh, assuming the cost R RT. Now this cost must be equal to the return. So what is the return? Return is first the increase in the value of the firm, right? The value of the firm will increase from one year to the next, or one time to the one instant to the next. So that that must be a part of return, and also. There is this direct return on profit, right? So whenever I enter the market, whenever I start producing that intermediate good, I start obtaining profits. And those profits are equal to IIT minus IIT, right? So that is the arbitrage equation for entrepreneurs, right? Entrepreneurs, we look at the market, okay? I'm gonna uh, spend resources on entrepreneurship. I'm gonna spend that money ET uh, only if the cost of the cost of finding that money is equal to the return I'm going to obtain from that investment and that that return depends on the direct profit effect of establishing a firm and the increase the expected growth rate of the value okay now how can how can this asset market clear? Well, uh, when I, so here we assume that uh, these entrepreneurs offer stock shares, okay? Remember that AT is the total assets in the economy, right? So the total asset stock, 
this is the supply of the funds, right, is equal to 80. So what is the demand? Well, at any point in time, there are NT firms in the economy, and these NT firms uh, each have value VT, all right? The total stock share in the economy is equal to NT VT, right? So, so whenever, whenever you invest, uh, you obtain these funds and these funds are coming from your, uh, uh, coming, up, coming from the households, right? These households own your firms by, by holding the stock shares, okay? So then if you, if you collect these equations together, you find another, another uh, equation that describes the movement of the uh, interest rate, okay? So we have one equation here from R&D, we have one equation here from entrepreneurship, and remember that we have another equation here from the uh, household problem, okay? So, 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 okay. So again, this is, this is one thing you can derive by using the results um, I, just, I just showed you. Now let's, let's look at the equilibrium once again. So price is fixed. Uh, there is that result. So this is the total amount of uh, machines in the economy. It is a fraction of the total output because you know, output is required in that, in that um, production. And this is the aggregate production function that I just showed you earlier, right? So if you go back to what I showed you earlier, you see, so there is number of, uh, this is the number of products, this is average quality, and this is labor. And this is exactly what you get if you solve the model, okay? Now here, we define X, this is, this is lowercase X, as the uh, quality adjusted cash flow, okay? Now gross cash flow is what? Gross cash flow is uh, profit out of the operating cost, right? So if you, if, you, uh, if you ignore the operating cost, the gross cash flow in the, in the firm is equal to P minus one times X, right? Now this variable, as you will see when you, when you uh, sit down and solve this model by pen and paper, you realize that this variable is the fundamental firm level variable that drives all the results, all right? So be, why do we do that? Because adjusting for quality is necessary. Why higher quality firms would produce a lot of units, okay? So that type of adjustment then implies this variable. So if you write the, uh, if you put these variables here, you arrive at this result, okay? So, so it depends on product quality. So kappa is at least equal to one, right? But kappa is usually greater than one in the second generation models. So it increases with average quality Sigma is less than one, so it decreases with the number of products and it increases with the size of the uh, population. Then using this definition, you can simplify many of the equations, all right? So you, 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 you simplify the R&D return, you simplify the uh, entrepreneurship return, and then you define the growth rate. This is the growth rate of average quality, this is the growth rate of the number of firms. Now, lowercase c, be careful here, is defined as the consumption output ratio. Okay, so this is basically uh, average consumption out of income. All right. And then the dynamic equilibrium is characterized by these three equations. Okay. Uh, this is the movement of X. So since 
uh, in time, uh, you know, remember what X is. X is the gross cash flow, right? So it changes through Z and an L. Now L is growing and Z is going to grow if you have uh, innovation and N is going to grow if you have innovation, right? If you have vertical innovation, Z is going to grow. If you have horizontal innovation, N is going to grow and L is already growing at rate lambda. So the movement of XT depends on this, right? Lambda is the population growth rate, kappa minus one times, what is ZXT? ZXT is the growth rate of uh, average quality here and NXTC, and N, N of XTCT is the growth rate of, uh, growth rate of N, okay? So Y dot divided by Y minus lambda must be equal to this. Again, how do I know that? Well, we know this from the uh, from this equation, right? The the, the production function, uh, and this is coming from the, defi the, the, the definition of this, right? So c dot divided by y dot. So you have the earlier equation here, and then minus kappa z minus sigma x. Okay. So, uh, okay, let me stop here. Obviously, we're gonna uh, we're gonna continue in the next hour. But let me let me stop here. If you have questions, uh, I can I can um, answer them. Otherwise, after the break, we're gonna continue. Okay, so my time is around three, uh, three ten. So let's meet at three twenty-five. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you.